My name's John Newell. I'm uh, the coordinator of the audiology course here. And uh, thank you for uh, showing up tonight and giving us your attention. I know it's late. You've probably had a big day already. So this is uh, it's a tough ask for you. Uh, but I'll keep the presentation relatively short and stick to the hopefully the important information. Um, we've got some students here as well today after the um, question time. Um, as uh, Scott said, if you're going to, you can stick around upstairs or go up and downstairs. Um, maybe our students can just stand up and show themselves. So you feel free to approach them and um, ask them questions. Uh, and of course, myself and also Professor Madula Sharma will be here as well to help uh, answer any of your questions as well. So. Without further ado, I want to tell you just a little bit to start off with about audiology. I mean, hopefully, most of you kind of got a pretty good idea what you're possibly getting yourself in for. Um, we're a relatively small um, group of professionals. There's only about, well, probably about two and a half thousand uh, audiologists in Australia now, so we're not a big profession. Um, but um, we're, a, we're a, a growing profession. Uh, we're one of six universities who offer a master's program in audiology. Uh, the standard, much the same as um, speech, but um, in audiology there is only a master's program. You cannot do an undergraduate program. So if you want to be an audiologist, you have to do a, a master's program, a two-year full-time master's program. Um, we are one of the universities who offer the, such a program, and we're the only university in New South Wales. So if you want to do a program in audiology in New South Wales, you've come to the right place. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, well, we would suggest, actually, even if you want to do a, a program elsewhere, you're a foolish person. Come here. <laughs> Much better. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute as well. So, uh, but briefly, um, I know you kind of grossly probably got an idea of what audiologists do, but just to give you a flavour of what, you know, the, the, the nitty-gritty of what audiologists might do during their daily uh, professional routine. Firstly, you might be involved in prevention of hearing loss. So um, some of our graduates might be involved with industry, mining industry, for instance, noisy industries, industries where people are going to be exposed to the damaging noise. You might be doing um, screening audiometry on professionals, on the uh, mining staff or what have you, the, the various workers there, and, and advising them on, on how they can prevent further hearing loss, advising their bosses on how they can prevent noise damage in their employees. You might be working in diagnostics in a hospital setting, for instance, seeing children and adults, maybe um, babies referred through a screening program, assessing their hearing using electrophysiological means and informing their parents of what's the pathway from here with their hearing impaired child. Uh, you might be working in management of hearing loss. You might be working particularly with things like um, hearing aids or implantable devices, fitting patients managing patients' everyday concerns with those devices and making sure they hear as well as they can. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, we're also involved in the assessment and management, of course, of more complex disorders as well. So that might be things like um, tinnitus or auditory processing disorders, or that might be managing um, complex paediatric cases, for instance, children with various other developmental disabilities who also have hearing loss. And we'll be working them with a range of other professionals, our speech colleagues, might be psychologists, geneticists, paediatricians, um, ear, nose and throat surgeons, etc, etc. Uh, or you might be involved in the evaluation or rehabilitation of balance disorders. Um, again, that's something not everybody knows that we do, but we are involved in particularly in the assessment and to some extent in rehab for people who've got um, problems with dizziness, essentially. Okay, so there's a variety of different avenues you can go to, and many audiologists end up doing a bit of, bit of many of those things, and sometimes starting out in one career pathway and changing to another. I'll show you a brief video in a minute of one of our graduates, and you can see which direction she's taken it, but there are many different directions you can go in audiology. Uh, so why in general would one want to study audiology? Well, it's pretty interesting, I think, as a, as a degree, as a profession. Um, a qualification from any of the Australian universities um, at a master's level will qualify you to work as an audiologist within Australia. So you finish the program and you are a qualified audiologist ready to work. Uh, but also overseas. Some countries, you know, we have graduates working in New Zealand, in Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, in uh, particularly actually quite a few of our graduates decide they want to stint in the UK, mainly I feel because they want to travel and explore Europe but um, they seem to have a good time, I'm a little jealous. Uh, and so, it, you know, there's, there's a bit of flexibility there in terms of travel as well. 
Uh, it suited the audiology course to people with undergraduate degrees across a wide range of areas. So you don't have to have done the speech and hearing undergraduate degree. <coughs> I think the speech and hearing undergraduate is a great um, sort of uh, building block to, to build upon, but if you haven't done it, that's okay. You can apply still and we will look at your application um, favourably and mainly looking at your grades and your, um, as Scott's already talked about, application letter um, to see whether you'd be appropriate for the program. Uh, it is a clinical degree, so you're going to do a, quite a bit of clinical work in the degree. You're going to do placements and you're going to be working as an audiologist and the degree is aiming to get you to become a clinical audiologist. So if you're not interested in working clinically, maybe this isn't the degree for you. So just to keep that in mind because there are other degrees which involve hearing science and so on, like research degrees for instance, which might be more useful and we could guide you towards if that's more what you're interested in. Um, the clinic, because it's a clinical degree, we're, we're sort of incorporating both, hopefully, a technological focus. So what are the technologies which will help people with hearing impairment? That includes both diagnostic and rehabilitative technologies, but also a social view of um, disability. So really, how are we going to help people with hearing loss to um, reduce the functional impairments, essentially? Okay, now, so that's why to study audiology in general, why would you do it at Macquarie? Because there are other options for you. Um, as I said, there's six, six universities offering the degree. Uh, well, um, we're quite lucky here. Um, we're really turning into a focal point for hearing, speech and language research. Um, and a big part of that is the building we're in at the moment, the Hearing Hub. So um, we're a core member of the Hearing Hub. So we, as you're probably aware, there's a lot of different hearing related organisations housed right within this building. Uh, and that's great for a number of reasons, which I'll talk about in a second. We're also a core part of what's called the CRC, the Hearing CRC, which is a large uh, translational research organisation or um, program, which funds research into hearing loss, hearing rehabilitation and so on. Uh, we're also the first Australian university to have a private hospital on campus. That's useful for us because we've got ENT surgeons in that hospital who we can um, build relationships with and involve in our teaching and so on, and mentorship and so on. Uh, we're also, um, as you notice over across the road there, uh, the location for Cochlear's uh, global headquarters. So um, we're quite lucky to have good industry partners right on campus. There's a few hearing aid um, partners who are very nearby as well which is great. Um, in terms of the hearing hub, okay, it's a nice building. Yes, it's fancy. Yes, there's lots of different hearing organisations here, but how does that help us, you as a student? Um, well, there are some reasons why it's important as a student to have facilities like this. Um, it means that we've got state-of-the-art teaching facilities. It's new, we've got new equipment, that's good for you because you learn on good equipment and on a range of different equipments as well. Um, so this is, we've got a fantastic prac room. It's a little embarrassing actually when visitors from other countries come to visit the audiology section and we show them around and we say, here's our prac room and it's full of all this fantastic equipment. Um, the look on their faces is, oh, well, we don't have all that. And, uh, you know, it's, we've got an embarrassingly large amount of equipment basically. Um, <laughs> and it's a great thing for you. Um, it's, uh, it means that you're able to learn more effectively. You don't have to sit 12 people to a single machine when you're learning. You can have a machine to yourself or a machine between a few of you, and that just makes everything much, much easier. Um, in terms of um, the other facilities here for research, although you might not be directly involved in doing research, um, it's still fantastic to have good research facilities around you, because having those facilities around you means, well, firstly, you may be able to learn using those facilities, the, the, the physical facilities, but you'll also have people who are involved in research which will then hopefully be reflected in their um, teaching of you and practice um, and, and translate into practice clinically as well. I'm just going to show you a very brief uh, video that our research group here has made just about the kinds of research which are going on here. Some of you will be directly involved in research as well. As part of our program we hope that you become involved in research projects and so some of the people you see in this film are PhD students. Some of them uh, also have master's students working with them during their second year doing these projects as well. So let's just have a quick, really quick look at some of these projects. 
Imagine you're at a loud party and there's noise coming from every direction. How do we actually listen to a single person's voice? What if you have a hearing impairment? How can we make communication easier for everyone? Audiology and hearing research at Macquarie University aims to discover new ways to answer these questions. In the Anikoi Chamber, we actually recreate any acoustic scene like urban environment, a train station or cocktail party and test people's hearing ability in a controlled but realistic environment. The MEG system allows us to see how people's brain respond when listening to speech. This will help us test the effectiveness of hearing aids, cochlear implants, or different therapies. So we know that normal hearing musicians are particularly adept listeners, and we know that children with a hearing loss have great difficulty with a lot of listening tasks. My research is, is looking at the benefits that music training might have for children with a hearing loss. As we age, most people develop hearing difficulties. We're doing clinical studies to find out how to best help them so they can remain an active part of our society. With EEG and eye tracking experiments, we're finding out how much effort the brain has to put into listening and our goal is to make listening easier. At Macquarie University, we're pioneering the next breakthroughs in hearing research, intervention and technology. So we can continue to communicate well, maintain our social connections and live healthier, happier lives. So that's the kind of projects that are going on uh, just at the moment. There's a lot of other projects, of course, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the flavour for um, the kinds of things you might be involved in as a student in your research degree or your master's degree, I should say. Um, we also are very lucky to have a good clinic um, on site, a state-of-the-art clinic, which is practicing, you know, best practice essentially. It means that um, you as a student will benefit from going to that clinic and learning in a best practice environment. That's important. It's also important, of course, that you see what happens in other clinics. So we'll also send you to a variety of other clinics as well. But having that home base, a good, solid clinic, <coughs> pardon me, with fantastic practice is very, very important. And we've got a great clinic downstairs with fantastic clinicians and clinical supervisors to do that. Um, having that there also means that um, not only will you get lectures from sort of high-end researchers and academics, but also we can involve those clinical staff in your teaching as well. Because again, it's a clinical degree. We want some clinical involvement. And so you'll have people like uh, Phil Nackard, our clinic manager, will be lecturing to you on aspects of clinical practice. You'll have those clinical supervisors coming to lecture to you and talk to you about clinical practice as well. How do we take the theory into the real world? Uh, and of course, we've got a bunch of guest lecturers coming from all these other facilities that are attached to the hearing hub who we can involve in our teaching. And that makes for a better learning experience for you if you're getting input from the experts in their fields, basically. ENTs, not-for-profit organisations who are involved in delivering services, parents of hearing impaired children and um, our industry partners, etc, etc. Uh, as I mentioned, facilities um, that we have here allow collaborative research and um, engagement with other, other organisations. It's just easy. Now we can, we used to have to travel to go and visit a, you know, a, someone who we wanted to be involved in collaborative research projects with. Now you just walk downstairs and they're there or upstairs or take a lift if you're feeling lazy. Uh, and, um, and you can you know, bump into and interact with people from a wide range of um, both um, researchers, international researchers who come and visit, and we've been talking in this very room in significantly more, um, more interesting ways than I am today, and uh, you get the benefit of listening to them and not just having the same old lecturers every week um, spouting off at you. And also potential employers. Some of the people who are involved in this collaborative group here within the Hearing Hub will be your future employers. And so having them on site is fantastic. Uh, those are some of the facilities down in our best practice clinic downstairs. Um, and uh, so we've got balance assessment, um, all sorts of assessments. Basically, it's just we cover all bases down there, essentially. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got a variety of different staff here um, from uh, res high level research and academic staff to more clinically focused staff. We've got a fantastic range of clinical specialists downstairs in the clinic who will also um, assist us with uh, teaching you. And we also have a clinic off-site 
um, at Liverpool Hospital. To give you a bit of a different flavour, it's a diagnostic clinic there, which does balance assessment and, and high level um, diagnostic assessment. So you get a benefit from that as well. Slightly different environment, but still very high quality practice and uh, fantastic clinical supervisors. So down to the nitty gritty, what about jobs? What are the prospects? Um, well, they're very good for audiologists. We have an aging population. Um, the number of hearing impaired people as a proportion of our population is increasing over time. Um, that's a bad thing for health spending, but a good thing for us uh, because it means there's going to be more hearing impaired people. Uh, and um, <laughs> sounds terrible, doesn't it? It brings a smile to my face, but. Uh, uh, there is a worldwide shortage of audiologists, and there is a shortage of audiologists within Australia as well. Um, however, the shortage of audiologists in Australia isn't distributed evenly, of course. There's a greater shortage in uh, regional areas, and not so much of a shortage in the cities. In terms of um, like thinking about, well, when do our students start to get job offers and when are they all employed? Well, we have industry partners come and talk to you or ferret you away on your clinical placements and ask you if you want to come and work for them. So um, this year, you know, at an outrageously early time in the year, we had about 50% of our students already employed. Our second year students before mid-semester break in their second year, about half of them were already employed. Um, yes, there's a tailing off towards the, you know, end and there are a few people still looking for jobs in um, January, February, the next year after they finish their degree. Um, but the vast majority of our students have got a job before the end of the year. Yeah. And the rest have got jobs um, like absolutely maximum by midway through the next year, the stragglers. Uh, again, if you're willing to work outside of Metro Sydney, um, you're you're, the world is your oyster. You'll have a job very, very, very easily. If you must work, you know, within a two-kilometre radius of where you live, then obviously things are going to be a bit harder. Uh, let's just have a brief look at Emma. Um, she's one of her past graduates, and she's just going to give a brief overview of her career path. Um, the video is slightly dated now because uh, uh, she talks about the Hearing Hub coming online soon, and actually, obviously, we're sitting in it, so <laughs> it is online. Let's see what she has to say. I'm Emma and I work at Cochlear in Sydney and I'm an audiologist. Hearing loss affects people of all ages all over the world and the area of audiology that I work in is cochlear implants. To me, working in cochlear implants is so rewarding because to see a child here for the first time when you switch on their implant and the difference that it makes to their life, it's just an extraordinary invention that changes people's lives. Another part I find really rewarding about the career that I've chosen is the bonds that you make with the other people that are in the industry. They tend to be really passionate about what they do, they love what they do, and just the families that you work with are so appreciative of the help that you give them that it just is incredibly rewarding. Studying at Macquarie really opened up a lot of doors for me. It allowed me to go into the career that I was really keen to go into. The other great thing about studying at Macquarie is that in the very near future, the Hearing Hub will have opened up and the Hearing Hub is going to attract world-class researchers and academics in the area of audiology. It will just add to the experience of studying audiology on campus. And I think it has, so that's good. Um, she, wasn't, she wasn't fibbing. So again, back to the nitty-gritty. What does the semester look like? We are slightly different than everybody else. We like to be unique in audiology. Um, so we start earlier than pretty much anyone else in the university in terms of our semester. So um, that's um, your timetable for next um, year, essentially. Your introductory workshop as a first year um, starts in that week on the 20th of Feb. If you're a second year student, so the year after, if you're studying with us, you start even earlier. So you start sort of at the start of February, 6th of February. Um, so, and then from that point, let's just go back to you as a first year again. So you have an introductory workshop starting before term starts. Then you sit through your normal classes during normal term time. Then you have a clinical preparation time. And then we send you off on a clinical placement block. Um, the clinical placements are a little bit different than the speech um, group here. So we have um, typically week-long blocks of clinical placement. So you'll be sent for a week to one location here in the clinic, Liverpool, or a variety of other um, organisations who we've partnered up with. 
and um, and you'll spend a whole week there working. Again, it's the, the idea of that rather than having the one day a week, um, which we used to have, is that um, it just lets you fall into you know a bit of a pattern in that in that particular workplace, get used to it, and hopefully practice your skills with the same equipment and the same clinical supervisor, and build a relationship with that sort of employer. Uh, it's we think that that's a good um, been a been a good change we've made in terms of audiology, and it seems to be working. So you might have during that clinical block placement there, which spans about six or eight weeks, you might have say two or three weeks of clinical placement where you're essentially working as an audiologist full time during that placement, and then you'll have a few weeks off. You know, you'll have four or five weeks off during that block maybe. Um, but it's pretty intensive. And then during the breaks, oh no, there are no breaks. You got clinical placements during your breaks as well. Now you won't have clinical placement the whole time, obviously, but you'll have the occasional week here or there. And of course, you might have things to do. Pfft, can't imagine what else you would want to do except audiology, but maybe you do have something, <laughs> Christmas or something like that, I don't know. So um, for those weeks that you're not available, of course, you'll tell us and we won't schedule for a placement on those weeks, of course. Um, but all of that clinical time is needed because we want you to get out there practicing so that you're ready to be a clinician when you finish the degree. Um, and uh, we have two clinical coordinators who uh, uh, make sure that you get all the placements that you need across a range of different environments so that you're ready to go when you finish the degree. You've got experience in all the areas you need. Um, typically the placements are Metropolitan Sydney but we do do some placements outside of Sydney as well. Um, any costs incurred in getting to those placements and staying there is, is, is has to be funded by you essentially, but there are, particularly for the rural placements, um, scholarships which we can uh, try and get you involved in so that it doesn't cost you a, an arm and a leg. Uh, the important dates are pretty much the same as for speech pathology there. We've got um, 31st of October as applications closing and uh, you need to have your personal statement and other documentation in by that time. Uh, by early to mid-December, we're going to start giving out applications then, and, um, and then by uh, the second week of um, December, maybe towards the end, we'll start getting offers out to people who've applied. Uh, probably closer to early January, the second round offers will go out. Um, and then um, you'll need to accept those before semester starts, of course. It is a fairly competitive degree um, and so or program. So again, the GPA um, you're looking at about five um, as being a you know credit average essentially in the in the old terms. Um, but you know if you're just under that, it's possible that you'll get in. Again, it's competitive, so it depends on the number of people who've applied and the standard of those um, people who've applied in terms of their grade point average, and on your letter as well, your personal statement. So you know, do put a bit of effort into that. Think about why you are interested in audiology and tell us why. Show us that you're interested in audiology. If you can if you you know if you've got some personal reason why you're interested, fantastic. If you've got a more, you know, research or esoteric reason why you're interested, fantastic. Tell us about it. Okay. Um, there are ten Commonwealth supported placements, that is where your tuition would be paid for. They're based on merit. If you are um, a rural or regional um, or remote uh, person applying for the course, you can fill out a, an equity CSP application and um, some of those places will go to people from rural or um, remote areas. Additionally to those 10 places, we do have two places for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. So if um, you identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander and you want to apply for those, please do so because they're there for the taking. Uh, in terms of application details, um, they're my details just so you've got them, uh, but you submit your applications online, just as Scott said, in the same way through um, that link there which is below. Um, ensure you put in all the documentation required and your personal statement, a maximum of two pages. Um, those applications open at, on the 6th of September and as I said, close on the 31st. Alright, thank you for your attention.